story about Goa, which is the state where I come from. They say that who you are today is often a result of the decisions made in the past. And those decisions are not necessarily made by you, but those decisions could have been made by anybody. In my case, the reason I am what I am today is probably because of a choice made by one of my ancestors in the 16th century. When the Portuguese came to Goa, they brought with them a, a huge number of religious orders who were very fanatical and who were hell-bent upon converting the entire population of Goa to Christianity. My ancestors lived in a village called Nagoa, which was close to today's Margao. Uh, there was a temple of Mahalsa Narayani in that village. And uh, that, that temple was common to the twin villages of Verna and Nagoa. So when the Portuguese came to Goa, they essentially embarked upon a very vicious and very aggressive program of proselytization. And in one year, 300 temples in Bardes were demolished. In the next year, 300 temples in the uh, district of Salset were demolished. This is documented figures. This is available in the Portuguese archives, this information. And if you go to today's temples in Goa, which have been uh, in an area called Punda Mahal, every temple will have its history, every temple will have a plaque in its precincts where this information is recorded, how the temple was basically rebuilt in a new area because the original temple was demolished by the Portuguese missionaries. So my ancestor made a choice to leave behind his land, his house, everything basically, and they moved to a place called Kunkolim, which is my current ancestral village, sometimes in the 16th century. Because at that point of time, Kunkolim was a village that was under a Hindu king, Saundekar Desai. And they gave uh, people who had escaped persecution of the Portuguese, they gave them land in the village. When um, Alphonse de Albuquerque came to Goa in uh, uh, 1510, 10, yeah, 1510. I'm sorry, I don't have my PPT with me, so I don't remember the dates. So I'll try not to take dates because I'm not too precise on them. But in 1510, the Battle of the Isla de Goa, which is today's state of old, today's uh, city of old Goa, happened. And the Portuguese defeated the Adil Shahi forces. It was a two pronged attack because the local population of the Isla de Goa, the Hindus, who were being persecuted uh, by the Adil Shahi officer Adil Khan of Bijapur, they had appealed to a guy called Timoji, who was the general of the Hindu king of Honavar in Karnataka. And they had said, please come and rescue us. We are being persecuted under the Adil Shahi rule. Timoja said, I don't have the wherewithal to defeat you single-handedly. So what he thought was, he would seek help from uh, uh, Alphonse de Albuquerque. So he basically told uh, Alphonse de Albuquerque that uh, uh, you attack the, the territory from the sea, and I will find, uh, provide you support from the land, and together we'll defeat the Portuguese. And that's what happened. And then the Portuguese basically established a post in Old Goa, in today's Old Goa. At that point of time, what Timoja had thought was that he would give an offer to the Portuguese that I will pay you a tribute, a monetary tribute. You take the tribute and you go back to your country. But the Portuguese decided to stay on. And it was a conscious policy that their soldiers would get married to the women who were captured after the battle with the Adil Shahi forces. And they would produce a race which was Portuguese in its thought, but Indian in its looks. And then started the program of aggressive proselytization. Temples were demolished. The Hindu people of the two territories, old conquestas, were told that they had a choice of uh, either leave the territory, leave their lands, leave their homes, or they could get converted. And if they got converted, then they would get a lot of concessions. So it was a typical carrot and stick approach that was used, that if you choose to become a Christian, you would get better jobs, you would get better facilities, you would get better rights. But if you chose to remain a Hindu, then you had to basically dispose of all your property in panic, and you had to move further. That further was actually crossing the river because on the other side of the river at that point of time, the land was controlled by the Saundekar Desais, who were the Hindu kings. Which is why crossing the river 
became a metaphor for a lot of Coens for escaping the tyranny of Portuguese. The most famous folk song of Goa, I don't know how many of you have been to Goa, but the most famous folk song of Goa, which is called Hau Saiba Poltodi Voita Da Mulya Logna Ko Voita Maka Saiba Vat Kona Maka Saiba Vat Da Koi. That means, I want to cross the river, I want to go to the other side to attend Damu's wedding. Damu is a metaphor here, the river is a metaphor here. But I don't know, I'm lost. I don't know the way. Please help me cross the river. That song is today considered a very happy song. If you go to Goa, you go to the river cruise and there everybody plays this music and everybody starts dancing. But it's actually a very sad, poignant song because the song talks about the urge of the persecuted people of Goa who wanted to go back to their dharma. They wanted to cross the river and they wanted to go to the safe side. Today, the reason why you find so many Hindu temples located in and around Ponda in Goa is because all of those temples were actually originally in the districts of Salset and Bardes and Teswadi but they were demolished by the Portuguese and wherever possible, the people escaped with the deities, with the main vigraha and they took it, crossed the river and went to the other side and they built the new temples here. Which is why today you find most famous temples of Goa in and around the five kilometers areas of Ponda. The only one temple in Goa that you can still see that survived the Portuguese demolitions is at a place called Tamdi Surla. And it survived because it was in a jungle. And at that point of time, it was very difficult to get to that temple. But that is the only temple that proves to you how pre-Portuguese era temple architecture existed in India. Now, why am I talking about all this today? And I haven't even got to the Goan Inquisition yet. So what the Portuguese did was, not only did they converted so many Hindus to Christianity, and they called them Neo-Christanos, but they realized that people were converting because of various reasons. They were converting because of fear, they were converting because of greed, they were converting because of the love of the land or somebody's influence, but very few were converting because of conviction. And they were going back to the ways of their ancestors. So they would still wear the clothes of their ancestors. They would still do pujas the way they were accustomed to doing. So then the Portuguese established the court of inquisition. Who wanted the court of inquisition to be established in Goa? It was Francis Xavier, who wrote a letter to the king of Portugal. The letter exists. It is there on Google. You can read it. Sometimes in 1548, if I'm not mistaken, the date may be wrong, but the letter you can still find it, where he has written to the king of Portugal saying that you must establish the court of inquisition in Goa because these people, we, you cannot really trust the Hindus, their hearts are as black as, as, as their murtis. After Xavier's death, the king of Portugal issued an edict that the court of inquisition to be established in Goa. And then the court of inquisition lasted in Goa for almost 252 years. In between, there was just a seven year period where there was a regime change in Portugal. That is why they stopped inquisition. But then once that regime changed, that Marquis de Pombal guy, he was deposed, Portugal came back to the court of inquisition. Court of inquisition had two inquisitors. They were directly employed or uh, appointed by the king of England and they were answerable only to the king and the pope. They were not answerable to the secular authority of Goa and they had wide ranging sweeping powers. Basically any person can, could uh, become a witness against someone and say that that person is a converted Christian but he is going back to the ways of his ancestors. So he can be arrested. And they were arrested and then they were tortured. There are documented tortures. I have documented it in my talk. You, if you search for my talk on YouTube, you'll find it. Right now, I have just 20 seconds more. I'll come to the question, why people keep asking me, whenever I talk about Goa Inquisition, why now? Why are you talking about it now? Why are you raking up the past? Because it is not the past. Because it is, even as I speak, it is happening. It is happening to the people of India in different parts of India. It is happening in Kerala, it is happening in West Bengal, it, is hap it happened in Kashmir. Which is why we should not forget it. Till we come to terms with our past, till we seek answers, till we get closure 
until we heal our wounds they will always continue to haunt us which is why it is necessary to speak about this till the church is held accountable to it because all this happened under the church's orders the church apologized to the rwandans the church apologized to the to the jews there is no reason why the church shouldn't apologize to the goans and the crime on humanity that it perpetrated thank you Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit cittt.net.